Hello and welcome back to the latest episode of The Deal Room, where I'm joined by our Director of Corporate Finance, Stephen Barnett, where we dive into some of the biggest deals that are ongoing at the moment. And one of the main objectives here is to bring these stories to life a little bit. And in terms of just giving you a heads up of what we're going to cover, we're going to talk about Manchester United. That might make turn people off very early or turn people on. I'm not sure when I say Manchester United, the football club. Uh, LSC London and the IPO market. I know it's something Piers and I have talked about, but definitely interested to get your take, Stephen. And then also JP Morgan and the First Republic transaction that happened soon after the collapse of SVB just a few weeks ago. So just given these topics then, they're not breaking news per se, but why are we going to discuss these ones today with you, Stephen? Yeah, yeah, it's a really good question. Uh, and thanks for having me on again. These aren't breaking news stories, but they are ongoing stories. And they're indicative of some of the trends that we are seeing across both the IPO market, which is the second story that we're going to cover, and also the M&A market as well. So the Manchester United saga has been something that's been dragging on for quite a few months. And we're not yet at the end of the saga. Actually, quite frankly, by the time you listen to this podcast listener, there may have been a preferred bidder. So this is kind of as live as it gets, although the news has been rumbling on for a few months. And what we're going to do with the Manchester United story, you know, even if you're not a sports fan, is we're going to break down the deal. We're going to try and figure out the financials, trying to work out whether it was a good deal for the Glazers back in 2005. Uh, and whether it might be a good deal for the potential buyers. So definitely taking off the pitch angle as opposed to the off, on the pitch angle, which I don't think I'm uh, I'm <laughs> able to discuss. <laughs> okay, cool. So maybe you could set the scene for us then. Just give us a bit of a short history of time of Man United. Yeah, this is a, this is a brilliant story. Uh, researching this story, I've absolutely loved it. You could almost create a succession I know that we're quite into that TV program at the moment, but you could almost create a succession story out of this. So maybe they will, who knows? So Manchester United, I think we all know one of the largest football clubs in Europe, in the world. In the 1990s, if you can remember that far back, it was all powerful uh, in the UK. It won the treble in 1999. It was considered to be one of the premier sporting brands globally. Just in the time that the Premier League was starting to kind of get its tentacles out in the US, cable television, Sky, all of this kind of stuff. In fact, by the late 1990s, Man United had already received quite a few offers to buy it, including from Rupert, Rupert Murdoch, B Sky B, again, another succession link. <laughs> but, in the, but in the early 2000s, the, uh, Manchester United were looking for new sources of capital. The Glazer family, a US family that already owned sports franchises over in the US, so kind of knew the business model, started building up their stake. They took their first stake in 2003, small percentage, built it up, built it up, built it up. And by 2005, they built their stake in the company up to over 75%. These are secondary market transactions buying off existing shareholders within Manchester United. See, Manchester United were listed at the time. So by the time they got to 98% ownership, you have to make a enforced takeover of the whole company. So that's what they did in 2005. So far, so vanilla. This is a takeover. This is a transaction. We all know, you know, we all know what it's all about. The issue came. Remember, this is a football club with a very loyal fan base. The issue came when it came to funding this deal in 2005. Man United never had any debt, never had any debt on its balance sheet, ran relatively frugally, relatively sensibly. The Glazers coming in and buying the company for about £800 million saddled the company with about £660 million of new debt. They invested themselves about £270 million and they refinanced some of the existing um, liabilities of the company. So the fans were really upset at this. You're buying our company and you're effectively saddling you know, our club that we love with debt in order to potentially get rich yourself. 
bearing in mind, some of this debt was extremely expensive. So it ranged, the 660 million pounds of debt ranged from about eight to 9% notes to 16.25%, a payment in kind note of 16.2, paying 16.25% interest. That is a lot. <laughs> that is really, really punchy. And, it's, and it puts a massive weight on any business when you've got those amounts of interest payments to pay every single year. The deal was also structured on the sharp end of leveraged transactions with kind of very Glazer family friendly provisions. So 50% of net income could be paid out as dividends. Uh, the, there was a provision to buy the Carrington training ground of the Glazer family for 95 million. There was a management fee that they were pay, that was paid to the Glazer family every single year. This feels pretty good for the Glazers, pretty bad for the fans. Mm. Fast forward on 10 years, or maybe even 15 years, and from 2013 to 2023, Man United hadn't won a Premier League title, which I think for fans was pretty shocking. A little bit of analysis from the blogger Swiss, uh, Swiss Ramble, very kind of good football business blogger, said that by August 2022, 1.1 £1 .1 billion pounds had been taken out of Man United in the form of interest payments, dividends, management fees, et cetera. At the same time, this is where the other half of Manchester starts smiling, at the same time, their rival, Man City, the owners of Man City had actually invested an additional 684 million in the club. Who's won all the trophies? Manchester City, mm. right? So in short, Blazers buy in 2005, extract quite a lot of money out of the business the business itself starts going backwards performances on the pitch are poor performances off the pitch are also very poor their revenue had dropped from 2019 to 2022 and their earnings before interest tax depreciation and amortization their EBITDA has dropped from 186 million in 2019 to just 81 million in 2022 so from all perspectives that you look at it, I haven't been to Old Trafford recently, but supposedly it's it's looking pretty tired, haven't had a lot of investments. From all perspectives that you look at it, the Glazers have come in, bought a company, saddled it with debt, extracted a lot of value, and the asset has actually got less valuable from a earnings perspective, from an infrastructure perspective, et cetera. So why do so why do people want to buy it? Yeah, I just just thinking that they're, they're trying to milk the best of this situation. They've come in, done what they've done, extracted that cash, as you say, and then given the somewhat euphoria on the back of what the Chelsea deal, they're just looking to move as fast as possible at this moment in time. But there comes one of my questions. So so kind of their their exit out of this trade or investment, so to speak. Mm. I always get a little bit um, surprised by when you know this isn't like um, executing a trade in 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 markets where you can just click a button. Let's say here, kind of like reminds me of like the IPO of Deliveroo. It was like you had all the U.S. delivery companies go very fast during the height of the pandemic. They they signaled they were going to do it. They were so slow in executing that almost feels similar with Man Manchester United. They couldn't keep pace of how quickly the transaction of Chelsea happened. They kind of lost the moment now. Mm. So now what? <laughs> and yeah, it's, it's a really interesting point. And I think Chelsea, I don't know whether you would say this is a benefit, but they were very time-bound. Roman Abramovich, uh, right. the previous owner, had to sell by a certain date. Um, Rain Bank, which is the company that it was just a financial advisor rain group sorry the financial advisor running the deal for chelsea and actually for man united as well uh they actually got two i think 200 long list bidders for chelsea uh mm. within the with, within seven days it was a really quick process narrowed it down to six or seven narrowed it down to one that deal was done for a total of 4.25 billion pounds that's a really really big deal convert that into dollars you're thinking about five and a half million dollars which is 
one of the most expensive sports franchises ever. If I'm Man United or if I'm the Glazer family, mm. I'm thinking to myself, well, we're a bigger club than Chelsea. Yeah. Look at our history. Look at all the titles we've won. And look at the global following that Manchester United has. So if they're selling at, at five and a half billion, one of the things that we like to do in the world of M&A is we like to do comps, okay. comparable company and comparable transaction analysis. So if I'm Rain Group and I'm advising the Glazers, I'm saying, look, you know, <laughs> Chelsea was a was a, uh, a a desperation sale. There was a very you know there was urgency to it. Maybe they didn't even extract the most value out of it. It was a competitive process. But Man United, you should be able to get you know a twenty to thirty percent premium on Chelsea. So why don't you Glazers start looking at selling for seven to eight billion dollars? You know six plus billion pounds. This 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 feels more like it for a company of your size. So it was in November 2022, three months after the Chelsea deal, that the Glazers announced that, look, you know, we're putting this asset up for sale. So then how, like you were talking about, from a financial perspective, revenues are declining from 2019 to 2022. There's kind of degradation in the physical assets that they own as well. Yeah. So as the banker, <laughs> I understand <laughs> you try to engineer the focus on the competitive kind of sale process being run and the price it was executed at. But how do you manage the other financials then that are black and white figures? Because the other stuff's kind of the gray matter, almost it feels like. Yeah, it's a really tough one. I mean, this is not like a, a sports franchise is not, in some ways it's like normal business, but in some ways it's absolutely not. So Manchester United, brand value of the club is considered, depending on how you value brand, upwards of £2 billion. So that's what you put on that intangible asset. So even if their physical as assets have degraded, their intangible assets have grown. Its revenue stream, although it's been decreasing, partly because they haven't got into the Champions League, is still very, very high quality revenue. Mm. And there are three times as many uh, demand for season tickets is still three times higher than what can be supplied. You know, you're restricted to 75,000 people in a stadium. So the quality of revenue and the quality of brand is still quite high. I was listening to a podcast yesterday about, about where do billionaires part their money? Great. Not particularly relevant for you or me. Uh, but, uh, you know, a, a sports franchise is not the worst place to put your money. You know, the returns seem, you know, the, the value of these franchises keep going up. The value of the television deals keep going up. The value of the subscription, uh, the uh, sponsorship deals keep going up. So if I am a billionaire and we're talking billionaire stakes here, you know, mm. we'll talk about the, the runners and riders in a second. If I am a billionaire, you know, there, are, there aren't that many places to park my money where I can have the kind of psychic benefit of owning a sports friend, you know, of owning something quite sexy and fun. And also, you know, I'm probably likely not to lose too much money because Man United, you know, touch wood are not going to get relegated. You know, they're a pretty robust sports team. Mm -hmm. So maybe, you know, there's a brand, trophy asset, quality of revenue premium that we're actually putting on, you know, what is a pretty averagely run company. Right. So in my mind then, you just said trophy asset. When I hear those words, I just think, right, <laughs> I'm going to go to my Rolodex and I'm going to go straight to the the, per, the Gulf, the, mid, the yeah. Middle East. And that's it. that's where I'm going to concentrate my focus because what, presumably Russian buyers are out of the question now, just given the, the situation geopolitically. So Saudis willing and open to get the checkbook out, particularly with that vision 2030 they have with trying mm -hmm. to have a broad appeal on a, a kind of more globalized level of diversifying their appearance as well as their economy. Is that the go-to place to go look at the Qataris, look at the Saudis, that type of market for this type of deal? Yeah, I think I think you've got two places to go hunting. You've got you've got the Middle Eastern money, you know, and it's been it's been put to good use uh, in the likes of Manchester City and recently with the acquisition of Newcastle. Uh, by a Saudi-backed consortium, so you've got the you've got the Middle East pool of capital, and that's actually where one of the one of the two main bidders has come from. But I would always I, I would also go hunting in the states mm. because 
you know, there's a few reasons behind it. You know, uh, billionaire, well, there are plenty of billionaires in the States. They are very used to owning sports franchises. They know what it's all about. That's why you have US interest coming into Liverpool, into Arsenal, and obviously into Manchester United. Obviously, very favourable exchange rates at the moment. So your dollar is going a lot. When the Glazers bought uh, Manchester United in 2005, uh, they bought it for £800 million, which was 1.5 billion, two to one. So now it's 1.2 to one. You're getting a lot more pound for your dollar. Mm. And suddenly assets, which we think are quite expensive, suddenly look quite well priced over in the States. And then you've got the third class, you know, which is where the other, you know, the other bidder has come from, which is your homegrown billionaire uh, that is ostensibly or purportedly a Manchester United fan. And this is Jim Radcliffe, the owner and founder of the Ineos Group, who's a die, again, he says he's a diehard Man United fan, but he also put a bid in to own Chelsea a few months ago. So I don't know, <laughs> I don't know whether he bleeds blue or red, I'm not sure. But uh, he bleeds he's money. That's most, what he bleeds. He bleeds money. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. But um, okay, so let, let, let's look at the actual, if the Glaziers managed to get this deal away, let's say. Has this been a good investment for them? What do they come yeah, out so of let, this with? What does that look like? Yeah, so let's talk about this. So just maybe stepping back, there are two bidders in the race at the moment. You know, we've spoken about, we've very spoke, spoken very briefly about Jim Radcliffe. He, uh, he has put in a, it's been a very protracted process. It started in November 2022. Glazers are playing it. They went from first round to second round to third round offers. Trying to play a little bit of competitive tension, trying to uh, play Jim Radcliffe off against Jake Jassim, who's the Qatari bidder. And they're trying to, eat, you know, it's basically, from what I understand, they are trying to get as much out of this as possible. So they wanted seven to eight billion. It's likely the bids that are in at the moment and the structure of the two bids from Radcliffe and Jassim are slightly different in terms of. Radcliffe is just offering to buy out the 69% stake that the Glazers own. Jasim wants to take the whole thing off the table, kill the debt, and pump some money into the club. So I think the fans tend to prefer the Jasim bet, uh, the Jasim bid. But anyway, so we're now circling around, instead of the 7 to 8 billion, which is what the Glazers wanted, we're now circling around the 6 to 6.5 million. Bearing in mind <laughs> that this is an enterprise value of 66.5 billion, which means that it includes the equity value plus all of the debt that is on the balance sheet of the company. Bearing in mind the company is trading at a market cap of about $3 billion at the moment. It's a pretty hefty premium. So let's see how, <laughs> yeah, let's see whether this is a good deal for the Glazers. And I'm I did a little bit of work on this, and I'm kind of viewing this as a private equity transaction uh, because it, it it shares quite a lot of the uh, similarities of a typical PE deal. Organization come in, they put a lot of debt into the into the company, and they hold it for a period of time, and then they sell. Now, obviously, many private equity transactions involve a lot more hard work to improve and turn around the company this doesn't really it doesn't really map in this scenario but let's have a look at it from a financial perspective so the glaze has put in uh, 500 billion uh, 500 million dollars about 270 million pounds back in 2005 so that is 18 years ago you've got to think about the amount of time that they've had this money in this particular asset during the course of 18 years, and I'm just looking at my little spreadsheet that I've done, uh, looking at the money that has been taken out, they took out $170 million from IPO proceeds uh, back in 2012 when the company listed on the New York Stock uh, Exchange. Their own share sales throughout the course of the last 10 years have totaled $570 million. That means that they did own 100% of the company. Now They now own 69% of the company. The dividends that they've taken out has totaled about $200 million and management fees has totaled just under $100 million. So, and also, if they sell for $6.5 billion, they're going to get about $3.5 billion out of their the sale of their 
add that all together, let's see if I can do the math here, then net proceeds after, you know, taking away the initial 500 uh, million, then net proceeds are almost 4 billion. So $4 billion made off of Manchester United over 80 years. The two metrics that we're going to look at here, mm. bring it back down maybe a little bit more to the textbook, are money on money and internal rate of return. Money on money is basically how much have you got out over how much have you put in, your money on money multiple. Typical five to seven year private equity transaction, you would hope for your money on money or money on invested capital multiple to be around two or three times. You put in 100, you get 250 out. That feels like a good deal over five, six years. Hmm. Over a much longer period, the money on money multiple in this instance, again, this is very rough calculations, is about 7.7 times. That's pretty nuts, right? Yeah. They have made 7.7 times their money. Wow. But they've held it for, uh, for 18 years. You know, time is money. <laughs> time, time has a value. And therefore, the second calculation that we do is the internal rate of return. Basically looking at the annualized returns spread over the 18 years. It's all well and good making a lot of money. But if you make it over 100 years, it's less powerful than making it over five years if you're not recycling your capital. So the IRR for this deal, the internal rate of return, average annual return over 18 years, is about 15%. Again, not bad. You know, private equity would, would be pretty happy with this type of return. So the Glazers, let's think about this. They're not well liked by the fans at Manchester United. I think at the end of every match there's a chant saying that the glazer should be should leave uh, and lots of banners on the st on the stands and things like that but they're pretty happy <laughs> they've made a cool 7.7 .7 times money on money at a 15 percent irr you know and they get to go back to their sports cars and their uh, and their sports franchises in the u.s um and well done yeah and, and like with the as much sympathy for the fans that period, I guess, like you briefly mentioned at the beginning, the shift we saw with, let's say, the Premier League as that specific sport and the transition of that new premiership model, if you like, which took football to the next kind of level and international. Isn't it, isn't the market only going to become more business oriented because now the reach is so globalized, you're getting more affluency and uh, abilities through technological means for people in China, India to get connected as new customers to bring in to this, um, particularly, I'm you know, talking long term, new advents and more access through Web3 and things like that, different means to interact with sport. So as much as I can sympathize with the fans, I guess what I'm saying is this doesn't surprise me at all, this type of uh, process. And Am I right in thinking that this is probably going to happen for every big sports club in pretty much every major mainstream sport? Yes. It feels it, inevitable. It, it's a bit, it's it such kind a good is, business. <laughs> it kind of is inevitable. And you see this at the lower levels and at the higher levels, you know, so there's, you know, the rugby union is private equity backed. The, 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 the premiership concept is private equity backed. There are plenty of clubs in lower leagues that are, bought by smaller private equity firms or maybe slightly less wealthy individuals with the intention of taking advantage of this corporatization of the business model of sport. And it's been happening for years. And you know, the US has been a <laughs> has always been relatively franchised and corporatized in its in its sporting model. Interestingly enough, the, the only way that I could push back on that from a UK perspective maybe from a European football perspective, is uh, the blocking of the European Super League. Mm. Happened, you know, happened last year. For the European Super League, the intention there was to guarantee revenue streams for these major football clubs. You know, at the moment, Manchester United aren't going to get relegated, but there's a big difference between getting into the Champions League and not. 
it's a big difference between coming third and coming seventh in terms of your uh, the share of the uh, TV subscription, the TV licensing wallet that you get. So the Glaze is being used to the franchise model in the US, you know, really wanted stable, guaranteed, you know, next 20 year income streams. This got kiboshed, partly due to fan pressure, you know, it became a government issue. You know, these are our cultural heritage. This is our, these are our cultural assets. Mm. And the whole thing got blocked. So maybe there is a limit that we are willing to reach. You know, the Saudis can buy Newcastle, uh, the Qataris can buy Manchester United, but we're maybe not quite at the stage that the whole model of football becomes mm. truly corporatized. Mm. Yeah, Who knows? fascinating. Yeah, yeah, great to <laughs> yeah. get the the breakdown. And look, I'm just conscious of the time. I know we've got two yeah. other subjects. So let's let's try and um, whip through these other two quite interesting areas. And in particular, well, it's something that Piers and I had talked about before because there's lots of headlines uh, where companies recently have favoured going to New York over London, listing on the LSE. And so, yeah, just wanted to get where you're coming at this, this story from. Yeah, so the reason why I picked upon this story was I was reading a brilliant article in the FT over the weekend. Uh, and again, for any student looking to, <laughs> to kind of turbocharge their skills, the FT is, is still a very good place to go. They did a brilliant piece of analysis on the 50 European companies that are most at threat or the most likely to list in the US. Stepping back a little bit, what does this mean? So we've got stock exchanges across Europe. The London Stock Exchange is still, I think, just about the biggest stock exchange in Europe. You've got stock exchanges in Paris and Amsterdam and Germany, et cetera. And that's where companies go to list their shares, become publicly traded, raise money, have a market capitalization, and do business, right? Pretty standard fare across, across Europe and across the US. What's been happening recently is a lot of companies that are domiciled in the UK, or domiciled in Europe, have realized that the US list, uh, that getting a US listing on the New York Stock Exchange, on the NASDAQ, is actually much more attractive for their long term growth plans. So this FT article looked at the 50 companies that are most likely to flee to the US, looked at three different metrics. I thought this was super fascinating. Mm. So the first metric that they looked at is how much of a discount do, their, do these companies' shares trade at on their domestic exchange relative to their peers in the US market? So <laughs> if I'm a company in the UK listed on the FTSE 100 and they trade at a you know 10 times price earnings or 12 times EV EBITDA multiple and I see my peers exactly the same types of companies trade at a 15 18 20 times multiple and what am I doing you know I'm missing out on masses masses of value here you know masses of shareholder returns why am I listed here instead of listed over there so just, also just, look, just, just, just yeah, on that point before we go into this, the, the next one. So why is that? Why is there more value perceived in that? Why is it 18, not 10 in America? Such a good question. And it's all about the size of the market and the liquidity of the market. So the New York Stock Exchange and the NASDAQ are both super liquid, super liquid exchanges. So much money from so many sources floods into these exchanges, as you well know, every single day, creating really, really high quality pricing, you know, price discovery and pricing data. Now, in the UK, for example, the liquidity is just not there. And what tends to happen, meaning that there just not, aren't enough, there's not the volume of buyers and sellers at the right, you know, the right number, at the right kind of ticket size in order to create a really good price for it. So looking at the analysis that we've just done, 
it seems that the majority of the people that are frustrated with the London Stock Exchange have traded that, you know, you IPO, volumes normalize at pretty low levels, and it doesn't really move off of a pretty low valuation. There's one stat just to back this up. And I know that this falls more on the Friday side, but you guys maybe can talk about it on Friday as well. The average daily trading volume in London and, el uh, and elsewhere in Europe averages around 0.2% of overall free float, while in the US, that figure is closer to 1%. So just much more action going on mm -hmm. over in the state, much more liquidity, much more options to boost share prices if good news comes out. Um, it, it's, just, it's just a better price discovery mechanism. And if I am, especially if I'm a growth stock, what I mean by growth stock is, you know, a lot of my price, a lot of my value is future, is future growth dependent, as opposed to existing or previous growth, then I'm much more likely to want to go over to the US, where they tend to price future growth slightly higher than they than, than they do in the UK. And that's obviously what we've seen a number of times and, and most most evidently with, with arm hoardings as well. Mm. So, so that's so we've done the first metric. What are the FTs other metrics okay. they're looking at? Yeah, good, good, good points. Um, so the second one was the percentage of US revenues. So if you're, you know, if you've got 30, 40, 50 percent of your revenues in the US and you're listed in UK or Europe, you're gonna be thinking pretty hard about jumping over to the end, you know, the New York Stock Exchange or to the NASDAQ. And then the third metric is the percentage of North American investors. Combine these three together, the discount, the US revenue, and North American uh, investors, and you've got a bunch of companies that are relatively likely, potentially, or would favor a potential US listing, either as their primary listing or as their secondary listing. It can be listed in two places at once. However, the top three companies that they had, Financial Times, had on their list, first was a company called CRH. 100 companies, a company that actually announced in March that they were going to list in the US, hmm. which again got people got people slightly concerned. Are they are they construction builder? Yeah, good good point. Uh, they're building materials. Building materials. But actually, their headquarters are in Ireland, okay. and uh, <laughs> their 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 share price trades at a forty seven percent discount to US peers. So if your share price trades at a 47% discount to your peers, <laughs> you're kind of thinking, you know, and bearing in mind that CEOs tend to get paid, you know, in the majority in, in options, share options, hmm. kind of, it's a bit of a no-brainer. 58% of their revenues are in the US. It's a no-brainer. So they made the jump, right? The next two highest placed on the list, according to the FT analysis, with British American Tobacco and GlaxoSmithKline. Oh, there's no way we we can we can't let those cr jewels of the crown of the realm <laughs> leave oh, the London Stock Exchange. Surely, there's oh, some precious names. tobacco industry. Yeah, yeah, quite. Um, that, but you make a really good point. Although logic and pure cold-hearted financial common sense says, "All right, GSK, get yourself over to New York," that's not going to happen. Hmm. Even though it trades at a 30 to 35 percent discount to peers, the majority of its employees, the majority of its operations mm. are still in the UK. Quite frankly, the UK government would block it anyway, because they need to keep some industry and so, you know, some of our some of our assets here in the UK. So there's a lot more at stake than just this piece of analysis. But it is a relatively good representation of just how far. The U.S. market is in terms of IPOs, in terms of the attractiveness of IPOing in the U.S. market relative to the U.K. market. It's certainly mm. something to think about. Yeah, another layer. I was just thinking there as you were describing it. Uh, yes, definitely. I mean, I, the number of times I've driven through towns I've never heard of and seen massive Glaxo buildings in the middle of nowhere, where there's, I guess, different different divisions. But the other thing was think about COVID. And think about the lack of supply of vaccines and the battle that was on between where vaccines were coming from, from US-based to European-based to UK-based. So as an um, 
a key asset to safeguard against future instances like we had, which was a lack of available supply of vaccine during what would have otherwise been very difficult to obtain that to you know, reopen the economy and so forth. So yeah, there's there's so many ways I could see that um, that would be very challenging. But then, so let's say I'm the CEO of Glaxo. Yeah. And given what we've discussed then, there's everything in the financial sense is telling me to leave. I know the UK government need me to stay. So surely I can lobby some way to get lots of R&D benefits, lots of tax benefits. How can I improve my life then if i'm not getting value as you said from those comparables let's say where can the government give me some upside yeah this is this is a this is a great point and it happens across all industries you know we see this we're seeing this very very clearly with uh electric with car manufacturers um deciding whether to Put their electric vehicle manufacturing bases in the UK, whether Mini should stay in Oxford and Vauxhall should stay in Ellesmere Port and, and, and things like that. And they say, look, we would love to stay. The financials don't make sense. So, you know, if you're not going to give me anything, we're probably just going to go to Europe or we're probably just going to go to the US. So you've got to give us something. The rationale to the government is like, all right, you know, so create 10,000 jobs and probably thousands of other associated jobs through indirect supply chains and things like that. 10,000 jobs equals X fair revenue, equals more consumption, equals more GDP growth. How much can we afford to subsidize to pay for that boost, right? So PSK, you've got a pretty strong hand when you're one of the largest employers um, in the country and you can put in plain English or in plain numbers, it makes more financial sense to go abroad than what's in it for me. Yeah, it almost feels like um, a game of chicken in a sense that I actually think that neither the company or the government can pull the trigger. And the reason why I think is the length to execute one of those plans, a plan to shift someone like Glaxo to the US. And then equally, the way that politics is at the moment in the UK and just generally the global scene at the moment being quite divisive, quite split, and also governments, I think, would be quite unwilling to commit to something that's going to take time to play out then. You know, I think economically, logically, it makes sense, as you described it, but I won't be prime minister anymore by the time that comes home to roost. So actually, there's other things on my agenda to, to get me re-elected. It, it, exactly, exactly. And and as you say, these mega moves take a lot of time. I think how long has HSBC been thinking about uh, relocating its HQ back to back to Hong Kong? You know, 15, 20 years hasn't happened. Everything won't happen. Cool. All right. Well, look, I'm going to set you a challenge now for the final portion <laughs> of the episode. Uh, and let's see if we can do the rationale of the JP Morgan First Republic tie up. But let's see if we can do it in the next five minutes. Okay, yeah, let's do it. And we'll skip. Yeah, we'll, we'll kind of we'll, we'll, we'll blur over the backstory a little bit and we'll skip straight to rationale. So yep. JP Morgan, a few weeks ago, acquired the assets of a bank called First Republic. Hey, Stephen, keep going. We, we, Sorry, can, that was just... we can roll with that. We can roll with that. It was just a quick blank. So We've still got five minutes. So JP Morgan acquired the assets of a bank called First Republic. First Republic were the third bank in the recent US banking crisis to suffer, basically suffer from a bank run. They <laughs> reasonably high quality assets that a little bit of contagion from Silicon Valley Bank and from Signature Bank led to a lot of uh, depositors withdrawing, which led to a classic bank run, which led to the bank effectively declaring bankruptcy and the FDIC, Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, stepping in and taking... Are we, are we, are we struggling from an internet perspective? Yeah, I think it's actually on my side. Um, it's okay. Can we, can, 
can we mash it can we mash it together or the, the audio for sure the video yeah if you're watching this on youtube on the video <laughs> um <laughs> for the speed so the speed to market process you're gonna have to just skip through the last couple skip of seconds it. and then we're gonna go again <laughs> all right let's try and go again so the deal rationale for jp morgan jp morgan is the biggest bank in the world uh it's the biggest bank in the u.s and it is <laughs> there's a number of reasons why JP Morgan would like First Republic as an asset, even if it is a distressed asset, you know, declared bankruptcy, that's not necessarily always a position of strength to be buying a company. Firstly, product strategy. We're talking here about cold, hard deal rationale. The First Republic tends to cater for well-off customers uh, with millions of dollars in assets. So your kind of wealth management division. Now, JPM is a beast in terms of investment banking and retail banking and private banking, but it misses out on the wealth management bit of the total banking solution. So it's only got about 4,500 financial advisors at the moment, uh, catering to that kind of middle tier of wealth, whereas Morgan Stanley has 16,000. Yeah, I'm really surprised by that stat. I thought JP Morgan would be far more represented in that area. Exactly. I thought so too. And therefore, to acquire what they call a white glove service, so very high quality customer service, First Republic is a very high quality bank in terms of the way that it is perceived in the US. It just got caught with the contagion and caught with the, you know, the issues surrounding you know, interest rates and, and things like that. So product strategy Here's an asset, it's on the cheap, it gives me access to a market that I'm not dominant in at the moment, which is pretty good. I would say financially, it makes sense. So, <laughs> so they bought the they they bought they effectively bought the company for $10.6 billion. It is deemed to be, well, from their announcements, they said that it's going to bring an incremental $500 million of net income. There's going to be a one-time $2.6 billion post-tax gain off, the, um, off taking the assets from the FDIC. The FDIC are going to guarantee and underwrite some of the riskier assets that it's taking on board. And therefore, you're thinking to yourself, all right, and it's deemed to be EPS accretive, a good transaction from a financial perspective, right? You've also got cost synergies. You know, if we're going through the list of deal rationale, so there was an article a couple of weeks ago that came out that said that JPM is going to axe a thousand jobs at First Republic. It's because it probably doesn't need, you know, you can mash two organizations together and there are going to be duplications of jobs, right? So you're probably not going to need a few of the back office staff, et cetera. You can save some money, you're going to increase your net income. But the real kicker is the timing. So JP Morgan, being the biggest bank in the country, is unable to buy a rival domestic bank because it already controls more than 10% of US deposits. Again, this is an anti-competition, a, uh, a monopoly uh, uh, type rule. But that's, uh, that, that rule only stands outside of an emergency rescue. So JPM can only acquire these types of deposit bases, these types of banks, in a, in a distressed environment. So that's why it was so hungry to buy this asset, because it suddenly got scale that it wouldn't otherwise have been able to get. So complementary in terms of product, great timing, cost synergies, and actually, you know, EPS accretive if everything goes well. It feels like a good deal. And we said last week that when a big organization buys a small organization, the share price of the big organization tends to go down and the small organization goes up. Well, actually, JP Morgan's share price went up 2.5% after the deal was announced. So this feels like a good deal. This feels like diamond on top again. Uh, it's, uh, I was going to say, that makes me sick, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's... Uh... <laughs> But you know, it's interesting, isn't it? It's just the big get bigger. So in a moment of crisis, needs must 
um, kind of ingenuity prevails, we'll find a way. And then we can't have a systemic crisis. It leads to consolidation. We had this during the kind of sovereign crisis, the financial crisis, uh, and it kind of reinforces that philosophy of too big to fail. <laughs> it seems, it, I, I can see how people of a certain disposition will be looking at this thinking, right, this is, this is not, not healthy. But then at the same point, if you have these massive banking giants, to me, it feels like the downside of being so big is it's very, you're very slow to maneuver. And we're going through what feels like the next technological evolution kind of shift. And so is there now optimal room, almost, it's, it's even better for startup. I know not right now because of funding costs, things like that, yeah. the environment, but to come in years to come, if they're so big, surely, well, plus, the upside is you can come to market strategy quick with a product or service. You might then be acquired as they would look to just gobble you up to internalize your product or service, or you can just pursue that as a fast growth engine for investor appetite to, to go into. Yeah, so it's a really good strategic point. I think that I think that we can view it makes sense to view very, very large banks as quasar utilities. And I know that, that you know arch capitalists wouldn't be very happy with me saying that. But you know, your too big to fail banks provide a necessary, highly regulated, relatively stodgy, too, you know, too big to fail solution that keeps the wheels of financial markets and of the economy going, right? And they, they should be classed in that kind of utilities type bucket. And obviously they have massive economies of scale uh, in terms of their deposit base that a small challenger wouldn't ever be able to reach. But what the small challenger can do is it can pick off, you know, it's like a little minnow and kind of nipping at the heels. It can pick off little parts of the big bank, you know, in terms of being nimbler to do trade finance or doing nim nimbler to do peer-to-peer um, -peer loans or whatever it might be, improving the state of product or the consumer. So actually, you've got these big beasts as utilities that kind of keep the thing stable, and then you've got this wave of minnow innovation underneath. But actually, isn't that bad for a consumer? So maybe we're not in too bad a state. Mm. Cool. Well, look, let, let's wrap it up there. Quite a lot, I'm sure, for everyone to digest. One thing I did see is on Spotify specifically, there is now a Q&A option on all episodes. So actually, rather than drop us a line on LinkedIn or message us on email, you can actually just leave a question on the episode itself if you're listening on Spotify. So please do. I mean, obviously, there's quite a few points of kind of terminology and things like that that Stephen was rolling out <laughs> as much as uh, <laughs> I feel like they were very eloquently explained. I'm sure there's a few that still might have a few questions or a difference of opinion. Always happy to take that, of course, uh, on the show. So, yeah, drop us any questions that you have. But, Stephen, thanks very much for your time um, on The Deal Room, and we'll see you next week. And I hear there could be a little bit of a succession theme for next week. I think so. I'm going to have to do my homework. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Take care. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks, Anne.